Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Francesca Muziani. Francesca is Associate Research Professor at the CNRS, the French National Center for Scientific Research, as well as the Deputy Director of the CNRS Center for Internet and Society, which she co-founded in 2019. She's also an Associate Researcher at the Center for the Sociology of Innovation at Paris Tech, and a Global Fellow at the Internet Governance Lab of the American University in Washington, DC. Francesca is the author and editor of numerous articles and books. She's Vice President for Research of Internet Society France, has collaborated with the French Parliament, as well as the French Council for Audiovisual Media, and is the recent co-author of a 2022 study for the European Parliament on Internet Fragmentation. Okay, Francesca, you know about our three plus one format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment at the end. Um, let me put the first question on screen and read it out loud. How do you interpret the relationship between users accessing more content and services online and the impact this may have on telecom operators? Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so to to answer uh, this question, I will first say that, well, internet users uh, are doubtlessly accessing more and more content and services online than they did uh, uh, five years ago, ten years ago. Uh, however. I would like to point out here that uh, one should be careful of not letting this assertion turn into a broader misunderstanding of what the internet uh, is, how the internet is structured, and how it can uh, how it can work. Uh, already in the past, and uh, actually this has led to other problematic regulatory proposals in the same area in the, in the past. Uh, there has been uh, the assumption that. Uh, content providers are uh, causing traffic on broadband network uh, on broadband networks, and they should be uh, compensated somehow. So, however, I would say that broadband users are requesting this traffic. However, however, they do already pay their broadband providers to deliver this traffic uh, to them. So, forcing content providers to pay broadband providers for delivering this traffic to their subscribers. Uh, basically would just result in broadband providers getting paid twice for the same uh, service. So this, this is something that should be taken into account. And it, it should also be noted like a second aspect. Uh, the internet consists of uh, more than uh, the broadband networks that users typically uh, employ to connect to, to the rest of the internet. Uh, there are a number of entities that um, operate uh, their own networks uh, independently of uh, these, uh, these incumbent telecom operators. Uh, the, several European uh, institutions, <laughs> the, the, the European Commission first and foremost most does so, uh, but then also universities, uh, the governments of most European member states, uh, multinationals uh, and so on. So uh, we should also take take care of uh, take care of this. So the relationship between the fact that users access more content and services online than they did before, and the impact on telecommunications should be nuanced somewhat, at least in these two respects. Okay. So basically, um, it's not content being pushed to users; it's users pulling content. <laughs> Uh, because they want to see it, which 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 is good, and and saved us all during COVID to a certain extent, um, and also looking at the whole value chain and looking at all of the users and producers of content, which actually made me think that it's true that with all administrative services also going online, obviously those are also uh, important providers of content, not as exciting as Netflix, but uh, certainly uh, important providers. Um, let me then switch to the second question where you already hinted uh, elements of answer. What are the inherent dangers, if any, of big tech being requested to pay for the network of telcos? And I'm mindful of the fact that you wrote that fragmentation report for the European Parliament. 
Yes, uh, thank you. So uh, I haven't yet said the word explicitly, but actually this, uh, uh, this current uh, debate uh, goes back to, uh, to, to a long-standing one and, uh, and a heavily controversial one, uh, not only in Europe, that is that of net neutrality. So basically, uh, this new regulation proposal plans to require to pay broadband providers for access to their subscribers. So I would say that uh, not only uh, this proposal to some extent violates the net neutrality rules, but also that it would go back on uh, uh, some pieces of regulation that Europe has uh, promoted in the past uh, few years, such as the 2015 Open Internet Regulation, and uh, would go against also a number of net neutrality regimes that have been uh, established uh, in other parts of the world. So uh, to elaborate a bit uh, on this, um, I have into the history. So these proposals to charge content providers for access to broadband subscribers are not new. Uh, they have generally been uh, rejected as um, as problematic. One can recall uh, what happened at, in 2012 uh, at the International Telecommunications uh, Union. There was a heavily controversial meeting where uh, a similar proposal was pushed by a number of uh, large European telecommunications operators. Mm -hmm. And this proposal was rejected in a multi-stakeholder way. Uh, by uh, by civil society, but also by governments, by a number of members of the technical community, and uh, by several uh, businesses. So one could ask, uh, what has changed in the past decade uh, that would perhaps warrant uh, going back on such a policy? But uh, I don't think that anything has happened that would uh, justify that. Um, and uh, uh, large telcos have continued to lobby for this uh, sending party pays uh, uh, normative uh, while well, they could have chosen to some extent to invest uh, those efforts in uh, uh, new services or in, uh, uh, in innovating some of the existing ones. Um, we should also point out that there is currently a transit and peering model uh, that allows to some uh, uh, for some competition in, uh, in digital markets. And adopting this uh, this new proposed model would uh, would really, um, in this sense, uh, harm uh, uh, Europe's digital agenda uh, because it would go against its commitment to to openness and uh, would really cause problems and break this uh, this competitive market for for peering uh, and finally so we, we can mention the uh, the open internet regulation uh, that uh, that is has been there for uh, for a few uh, for a few years and among other things it stipulates that um, there is a right uh, for end users in, in europe to uh, to have uh, access uh, to uh, to information and content uh, distributed to them, use and provide applications and services of of their choices. Uh, so this, among other things, requires broadband providers to treat data in non discriminatory fashion, no matter uh, regardless of the recipient and uh, of uh, what uh, what this uh, what this data uh, contains and uh, where it ends up. So this is the basic uh, tenet of uh, of net neutrality. And uh, uh, so charging some content providers uh, for access to the network, but not others, uh, as has been discussed in the past, uh, violates uh, the spirit and also really the, uh, the phrasing <laughs> of, this, uh, of this regulation. So you've dropped the, the, the word net neutrality uh, is uh, at stake when discussing these proposals. Um, I think it's good to have reminded us that it, they've been discussed multiple times and rejected every time and in, in not just in Brussels, but even in international fora like the ITU. Um, and also, I think uh, the fact that um, the principles to a certain extent or the philosophy that is behind the open, open Internet proposal is that the user is the one picking winners uh, and picking who they um, interact with. And it should not be the broadband provider or you know the content providers because they have maybe some have deeper pockets than others. Um, let me switch then to the third question, which is a bit more um, narrow in in focus. Um, but it's because 
there's a lot of discussion of who's investing what where. Um, do you think it is appropriate to compare the contribution of big tech and telcos in infrastructure as suggested by some? Yes, thank you. So I, I think that uh, what is useful to point out uh, in regards to this question is uh, broadband networks, broadband providers uh, make the uh, the argument that they are an important and fundamental part of uh, the Internet's value chain, of the, the Internet economy. Uh, and uh, perhaps it's useful here to, to say that so are uh, content providers uh, and, uh, and service providers, uh, because in a sense, uh, they are the the key the key actors uh, whose services and whose uh, content uh, drive in some way the demand that uh, Europeans have for for broadband uh, access. So uh, broadband providers do receive uh, quite substantial uh, benefits uh, from the efforts of uh, content providers to create uh, content that. Uh, the subscribers to broadband actually want. <laughs> uh, so in uh, in this sense, uh, uh, once again, we can uh, we can cite the fact that uh, uh, public broadcasters, governments, universities are also content providers and contribute to uh, to making uh, this infrastructure useful and needed and, uh, and necessary and uh, thus valuable. <laughs> uh, so all these these actors are in some way investing uh, pretty heavily in uh, in internet infrastructure uh, already uh, and uh, um, they pay internet service providers to transport their traffic to uh, broadband access networks and uh, they pay content delivery networks to store their content as close as possible to to end users and actually some content providers sometimes perform uh, these services uh, themselves <laughs> which is uh, also a good thing to uh, to remind so uh, for all of these reasons yeah, i guess that if there is a comparison to be to, to be made between the, these two actors it is uh, it can be done in the, in this way uh, we can once again uh, as a as an open letter to uh, to the commissioners uh, signed by several academic experts and the civil society representatives recently uh, mentioned uh, is that both history and uh, and economics have uh, have shown that uh, these these fees actually are unlikely to increase investment in infrastructure from uh, from telecoms, uh, and uh, uh, there are bigger barriers to deployment than lack of funding. So, for example, uh, permitting uh, construction capacity, and actually, uh, the war, uh, the recent uh, war in uh, in Ukraine, has showed, for example, that the country's decision to move from a highly centralized internet to a a uh, more decentralized one has made it much more uh, resilient uh, to uh, to a number of uh, uh, of issues of um, attacks on data centers, uh, denial of service attacks, uh, very physical harm such as fiber cuts, and so uh, a, a proposal for uh, such as the one that is uh, put forward now would probably make Europe more vulnerable uh, to, to attacks because uh, uh, because of the lack of investment in, in these uh, in these infrastructures and the concentration. Okay, so you see the relationship between content and infrastructure as a symbiotic one, one that actually. You know, no one wants an empty pipe and content and services do not get to users if there is no pipe. So uh, they need each other. Um, the fact that um, everyone is paying for their part to a certain extent and that even some content service providers go further, further than others in terms of uh, deploying closer to the user um, their, their content. And then the fact that... Um, we need to create the right incentives for uh, investment into infrastructure. And this approach might not be the right incentive uh, creator, uh, but there, there are things that need to be uh, made better, let's say, or more efficient in terms of rights of way and, and how um, networks can, can be rolled out uh, more easily, maybe in Europe, beyond funding, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, which makes us come to to the last moment, seeing that you've you've already hinted at some solutions maybe that could be helpful for telecoms operators. 
the wonderful soapbox moment when uh, Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission, and Roberta Metsola, President of the European Parliament, appear on screen, and you have one to two minutes to deliver um, your message, your recommendation uh, from your experience to the powers that be in the EU here in Brussels. There is this uh, current proposal that mm, resembles or uh, takes something from uh, uh, other proposals in the past that have been uh, uh, thwarted for uh, for reasons that have been uh, discussed at length. Uh, but most of all, uh, they can drastically undermine net neutrality in Europe and the world. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, they would do so at a time in which uh, Europe is going, uh, for the most part, uh, the other way and in a in a in a in a good way. Uh, there is a what is in my opinion and uh, once again in the opinion of uh, uh, several uh, colleagues uh, in the academic world and beyond uh, a, a positive momentum in terms of regulation uh, of, of the digital society and, and economy in a number of areas uh, that are ranging from uh, from platform governance to to data protection uh, and uh, in which uh, uh, for example, uh, panels such as the the one for the future of science and technology that, that advises the European Parliament is uh, asking itself a crucial questions such as uh, what to do with uh, uh, internet fragmentation, uh, and, uh, and this is which is the subject of a um, of a report uh, which I recently uh, authored, uh, and uh, which one more was more shows the need to uh, to act uh, in terms of a regulation of the digital economy, uh, respecting uh, the fundamental rights, uh, and civil and human rights that uh, that Europe protects in a, in a number of uh, other areas. So uh, there is no reason why uh, Europe should not continue to uh, lead by example, show uh, the example in this domain as well and uh, avoid setting uh, really what would be a critical precedent uh, with this proposal, one that would go against uh, uh, the net neutrality regulation uh, it has chosen to uphold in, in the past uh, several years. Thank you, Francesca. So basically, Europe, you've been forward-looking so far, don't become backward-looking suddenly, um, would be the summary, um, which is flattering for Europe in the sense that a lot of good things have been adopted in the digital space uh, recently uh, and basically uphold that vision of uh, users being uh, at the center of, of policy making. Uh, in the future. Thank you so much for your insights. And it's the start of a discussion. Uh, as we know, these things take some time in Brussels and will probably uh, develop over the next months. And uh, who knows, maybe we can have a follow-up discussion uh, once we know more. With pleasure. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs>